captures what you're trying to explain in a simplified form to help understand. So who in this room is a modeler? Put your hand up. Okay, so everybody whose hands down, put your hand up. Because we all model every day, right? Who's ever put their hand on a hot plate? <laughs> Did you update your prior that it's going to hurt? So every day, everything that's alive, in fact, bacteria even model, they shrink away from heat. So, you know, it's inbuilt in being alive that you're modelling. You're creating a cause and effect understanding of what you're doing in the world, okay? So what I want you to do is to actually draw a model. So, for instance, I have two suns. So, suns. I have cheese. Well, I start with cheese in my house every two weeks. So we'll have a clock for time, we'll have dollars for the economy, and then we'll have mum's frustration. <laughs> so the cheese goes to my sons, uh, who like that, but the cheese going down actually causes mum's frustration, because mum has to go to the economy to buy some more, but my degree of frustration is tempered by how long it took them to deplete the cheese in the house. <laughs> So if they deplete the whole four kilos within three days, there's mega frustration. Right? So that gets reinforcement, which comes back in a negative way on my side. <laughs> so <clears throat> with that kind of thing in mind, just pick something in your life, whether it's your project or a sister ecosystem or your siblings, your housemate, whatever, and you've got two two minutes to actually draw a model of that system. Is this gonna work today? Oops, if I turn it on. Right. So you ready? Start drawing. Oh, actually, I gave you a minute this time. Sorry. Keep going. You got leave a less time, but it shouldn't take you very long. You will have time to refine it later, so don't panic. Just try and get the basics there. Okay. We will revisit this through the course of the lecture, so you'll have more time to perfect it, and I'm going to put them up on the wall afterwards. So there's a guy back in 1966 formalised the concept of the different kinds of models that you can have, and what you're trying to balance inside those models. So there's a guy called Richard Levins, and basically you've got... Um, just the pointer instead of risking my neck falling off the stage. So you've got three things you can have in a model. You can have precision, you can have generality, you can have realism. But you can't have all three at once. So if you can imagine a piece of sticky chewing gum or something, you can stretch it so far and then it breaks. And it's the same with modelling. You can't put everything in a model because then you've just got the real world and it's not very useful. Okay, so if you imagine trying to go to the dinner tonight, you know, if Chris just said, gave you a blank sheet of paper, it's like, well, as your map, you couldn't find it. If you just put a simple cross on it, you still couldn't find it. But if he gave you something where every single dog and person and car was all moving around on it, you'd just be just as lost as in the real world. You need that magic spot in the middle which gives you enough information to navigate but doesn't overwhelm you. And that's why you need to have this balance. So the different kinds of models are use those three different properties in different ways. So mechanistic models being in precision and realism, but you need to make a new one for each process or each new location. Statistical models bring in precision and generality, so they can use the same statistical method in multiple places, but the realism is low. You, you can't, that's why you can't extrapolate, they don't have the internal dynamics. Qualitative models are a method that I use quite broadly, even when I'm going on to build one of these other kinds because you can get the generality and the realism, the real components of the system. So this is a qualitative model. 
without necessarily, you don't have quantitative precision, but you can still understand the mechanics of what's going on. And you can, I'll talk about this later, you can, math, you can turn that into mathematics and instantaneously do a press perturbation. So see what happens if I suddenly racked up the price of cheese, how much cheese my sons would eventually get to consume. So you can, you can combine all those things. So when you're starting a model, you pick your spot, you pick your question, and what you want to do about it. So a lot of my models are spatial, so that's why I start with the location. And the question, I actually do this part with the people I'm doing the modelling for. I don't, it's not a pipeline where I invent the model and take it out and say, does anyone want to use it? It's a very collaborative process right from the start. You work with people to understand what they want and what they need in the model and actually to bring their knowledge in. So this is kind of my checklist that I have my students think about when they're making a model. Again, we come from an ecological side. If you're coming from a human side, you probably have a lot more detail here and step back to a, a simplified ecology. But it's the major systems, the major parts of the system, how they link together, um, and what are the key processes that you want to represent. You don't have to represent every process, but the key ones that you want to think about. So, thinking it in that terms, with this kind of checklist in mind, so what are the key components, what are the key parts, how about you think about revising your model or continue with your model. Okay guys, we'll come back to it again later. So there's different types of models as well, okay? So I have, well, I have one young adult son in his early 20s and I have a teenage son, right? Both of them really want to get motorbikes. I'm not so keen on the idea. I've seen the statistics of how many people end up as organ donors if they own a motorbike. <laughs> And I keep telling them that rather than keep pestering me to buy them some high-end road bike, they have perfectly good push bikes. <laughs> They're not actually going to be riding the hour, well, the 40 kilometres into Hobart, the major city. They really only just want to go to the pub down in the local village. My youngest son doesn't realise that. So I already know that that's where he wants to go. <laughs> My oldest son is facilitating that, so that's another discussion. But the... Um, they refuse, I keep telling them they don't need the high-end stuff, there's lots of different options in between. So it's the same with models, you tailor it to the situation you want. So for the IPCC, they probably do want something at this end with the number of people that are interacting to get that information. But for lots of the questions that we ask, something at this end is perfectly fine. And you're sort of drawing one of these at the present moment. So you tailor the model to the situation you're in, and there's quite a range of model types. So there's the conceptual model that we've been drawing. There's a toy model, which is a set of simple equations. 
you know, look how much economics has been done on a fairly simple equation that I'm sure Rashid will come. Well, Rashid showed you the formula already. Then there's ones such as uh, fishery stock assessment models that have a really strong focus on one aspect of the system. And then there's what I was calling shuttle models, but a lady called Eva Plagani has sort of changed it name to be models of intermediate complexity. So they've got a little bit of everything, but not in huge detail. And then you get into full system models, where there's lots of aspects of both biophysical, economic and social, and they've all got their detail in about an even mix to pull it in. There's lots of sources of uncertainty in models, so I'll get this up and out there at the start, we'll touch on it later again properly. So the parameters are what we know about, so when you put a model together, the way the numbers that you say, like the rates, how fast you grow, how fast my sons eat cheese, those things are parameters, and they, um, they're the things that most people worry about. So you get it back from the reviewer, you haven't done a big enough sensitivity analysis, now the problem is that that's only a small part of the question. It's also much harder when you get to complex models. So I deal with what's called whole of system models where I do try to model everything. So from the biophysical world to the economic decisions to the social outcomes and the social behaviours, the psychology, the fishermen's all in there. So to try and do a sensitivity analysis of that would actually physically take me longer than the universe has existed. So that's not that feasible. Uh, the other aspect is that it's a non-linear process. So if I stop my model after one week of model time, one month of model time, a year of model time, I get a different answer as to the sensitivity because there's feedbacks in it. So that makes that a hard enough problem as it is. And there are solutions to that. You can just do the most pessimistic version of the world, the most optimistic version of the world, the one that you think is okay. But there's another whole branch of models that are modelling uncertainty that I touched on the other day, and that's how you put the models together. What's in the model? What's connected to what? And that's called structural uncertainty, and that's way more important, actually. Um, there's a third type of uncertainty, and that's best dealt with scenario. So that's the long-term context that the model is sitting within. So if we think about using the IPCC as a source of information, so you've got, at the present moment, you've got the, the model spread. So you've got the dark line in there is effectively your parametric uncertainty. The broader orange is your structural uncertainty. It's different models come together to make what they call an ensemble. So you can see the broad range of, if I change my internal assumptions about what's linked to what, what's the outcome. And then this blue set of things is actually the RCP. So what, how do we, what are the human decisions in the world? So if we all decide we're going to do something about climate change and we invent <coughs> technology to suck carbon out versus we don't give a shit and we keep going as we are, you know, that's the range of extra uncertainty. And you don't necessarily want to capture that explicitly in the model equations, but you want to change the question that you ask the model. Under these circumstances, what does the model say? Or under these circumstances, what does it say? So that's sometimes a change of parameters. <clears throat> Sometimes a change of what you put into the model as the base conditions, but it's another set of uncertainty we need to think about. Now models span many, many uh, orders of magnitude, and so I managed to miss, mess that up, but that's a 10 to the 10. So that's 14 to 16 orders of magnitude, right? So when I first started yeah. discussing this uh, with people about what was going into the model, they what are you doing that for? And I said, because there's actually the coastal and shelf processes you care about go over 10 orders of magnitude. And they said, but you've got to answer management questions. Yeah, but that goes over four orders of magnitude, but I think about the guy who's got to manage the fish and the beach and then the region. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we always are interacting with four, about four orders of magnitude in space and time with regard to what we are doing in our daily lives and the decisions that we're making. And that's why it blows out quite quickly to cover many orders of magnitude by the time you think about all the things that influence the things that we need to, to be dealing with. So there's, these are the kinds of things that um, I have to think about and this is the best way of thinking about them is like cogs that are all interconnected and grinding on each other. So that's... It's, Think of it a bit like an onion. So you've got the central part you care about, and then you've got the concentric rings about around that, about what influences the things I care about. Now, what influences those influences? Step out again. Now, you don't need to always continue to put in every part of the onion, but you do need to mentally think about 
what are those influences? Do I need to do it? So it's a conscious decision when you make your model is, I consciously put this thing in, but I equally consciously leave this thing out. So every time you decide to put something in, you have to make sure that you're intentionally leaving things out. Don't just do it by accident. That's where you get your nasty surprises. And believe me, I've, you, no one in this room can make dumber mistakes with models that I've already made in my life. So the main way that I use modeling is what's called management strategy, and I can't spell apparently, management strategy evaluation. So the, I basically model the whole adaptive management process. So I have the biological world, so the geophysical drivers like climate and sediments, the ecological processes, the food web, the industries that exploit that, so fisheries is an example, but I do other industries as well. The social and economic decisions that condition how these people do that exploitation. But also the assessment and management process. So how do we collect information on this system? How do people make their management decisions? Then the, how does that decision influence how these people do things? So there's not the assumption that just having a management rule means that these guys automatically do as they're told. You allow for non-compliance. You allow for inventive ways of getting around the rules so that you can understand everywhere that your management suggestion might actually go wrong. The best thing about being a model is that you can actually put in lots of different options about how that world works. And the reason to do that is that we don't always know, so you want to play out those different options and see if it makes a difference. But also it's a way of letting people be heard. It doesn't hurt you as a mathematician or as a scientist to actually say, okay, let's see if the way that you say the world works actually reflects what you observe. So some of the places like on Ningaloo, um, we actually went through this process. We had one particular old lady who still thinks that, uh, gives me a bad name at Scrabble name, games. Uh, she had a very fixed vision of how the world worked. Okay? So I made a little model of it and we stepped through the steps of what that meant for the number of fish in the water and the number of fish that her daughter's tackle shop would see go through. Now her daughter initially thought exactly the same the way that she did and while I once we played it through it was obvious that that wasn't the way the world worked it didn't match what the daughter was seeing now the old lady didn't accept that change she said there must have been something we'd done wrong but her daughter did actually accept that the vision that her mother had that she'd been taught of the way the world worked wasn't right and while she didn't immediately come over to the scientific view there was a halfway road. She started to bring in more of that science understanding. She didn't recognise it as science understanding. She just recognised it as, oh, it's an observation. I can see that that's not right. And that's what encouraging citizen science and participation is about, to get more evidence-based decisions and understanding. You're not going to win over everybody, but you can help them see that there's nothing like learning for yourself. Okay? There's a Chinese saying that I am not going to try in Chinese at all, but it basically boils down to, yeah, if I hear it, that's kind of one thing. If I see it, that's more important, it's tangible. But if I do it, I really learn it. And that's the same with modelling. If you can help people through that process, you go a long way. The other thing I don't do is I never give an optimal answer. So this, Rashid will uh, agree or disagree with this as he likes, but a lot of economists not every economist, which is probably an exception, but they optimise. They say, this is your optimal answer. I don't ever do that because there's so many competing objectives that you can't get a sensible objective function to do the optimization. And it's not my place as a scientist to put those weights on. So what I do is I come back and say, these are your objectives and these are the ways you want to manage the world. Did they meet? Did those different options meet the objectives of everybody? What you want to avoid is one that fails to keep anybody happy. But actually, this one is equally as bad, potentially, but that's a decision that they have to make, where you've got some people very happy or some objectives very well met and others are completely disastrous. What we typically aim for is trying to find what's called in Australia the minimum acceptable whinge. So <laughs> whinge is when you're upset and you're complaining, so you want as minimum complaining as possible across everybody. So everyone's kind of happy. That's about the best you'll get in a big complex system. But by coming back like this, I'm just giving them the information. I can support them in understanding that information, but I'm not making the decision for them. So in these models, we can now represent all of these biophysical processes. So what's happening in the water? How does that influence growth and feeding and movement? 
all the different sorts of mortality, the food web production up through the system, how they use habitats. But equally in the human world, we can represent a lot of things too. We're still not very good at representing, dynamically representing governance and how that changes through time. But we can represent the individual sectors if we give them the governance rules. And part of the reason we're not very good at this yet is because no one collects data on it. It's hard to, there's no data, so it's a data-free zone. So I could make up anything I wanted and no one would be able to tell the difference. But it's important to me to have a tangible link to reality, so that's why we haven't tackled that one explicitly. We have tried some examples, so I won't name the uh, fishery in question, but there's a particular fishery, or well, this actually applies to quite a few fisheries, where if you model the decision-making process and its outcome, it's really just what's called a random walk. So there doesn't seem to be a set pattern. It's sort of just, oh, we'll try this, no, we'll try that, we'll try this. <laughs> uh, in fact, we call it the drunken random walk in, what, <laughs> in the paper where we wrote about it. So when you think about what you need to put into a model, you don't necessarily need all of that in every question. So you think about which processes you do need, the amount of detail. Can you get away with a really simple equation or do you have to go into a lot of depth? If you're modelling the physiology of an animal, you probably lo want lots more metabolic details than if you're modelling the global food web, you probably don't need the detail in every individual. It's kind of like if you can imagine taking a step back, you list off the things that you need, and then you step back one layer and say, actually, I can model at this layer without all of that fine detail. I can capture that detail in the parameters. So, for instance, in a global climate model, they parameterize clouds and things like that. They don't try and represent the different <coughs> clouds. Uh, you also, the key thing to think about though is what introduces delays into the system. So, what, what's dictating this delay here? Is it hunger? Is it fear of my response? Now, what is delaying my sons consuming all of the cheese in the fridge instantaneously? Because it's those delays that actually lead to the non-linear dynamics. So, if we think about coral reef, they're not useful as habitat when there's this big. They have to grow up to be big first. And so that growth is a delay, and that's where you get your nonlinear responses. The other way to get nonlinear responses is with feedbacks. So when we link different parts of the world, so the biophysical world and the economic world, for instance, we often have a one-way connection. So the economics is responding to the biophysical world, but isn't having an effect on it. But once you make that two-way connection, that's when you start to see the inter interesting dynamics, the interesting responses and changes. So we often, when we're starting a new area, do a one-way connection because it's easier, but it's, you don't get the richness till you start to tackle the two-way part. There's also putting in too much detail can be a problem. So uh, this is a, a, a one from Costanza and Skylar, but I found, well, I basically did this as a part of my PhD when the dinosaurs still roam the earth. So basically you look at how much detail you need in every dimension, how much spatial detail, how much temporal detail, how much process detail. And it's a bit like that map. If you have too little detail, it doesn't work very well. If you have too much detail, you get lost, you've got cumulative error. So being effective follows this kind of curve. Now a crap modeler or a crap model can make fill in the rest of the space. You can get really crap down here regardless. But the best possible follows this curve. And that's something that we've been yet to disprove in every field of So it looks like this is a true sort of rule across all kinds of modeling. So like, but I said it's a necessary condition to be intermediate, but not sufficient because you can still screw up. So that's where you get comments like this. Don't try and put everything in at the same level of detail. So if you think about that elastic sheet, that piece of bubble gum we talked about before, you need, if you pull it hard in this direction, then one of the other dimensions has to contract in. So if you're going to put a lot of detail in one area, then you have to put simplified detail somewhere else. You can't have super detail everywhere, or A, it takes forever to run, B, it takes forever to figure out it's not actually working and you've wasted that time. Um, and it's just not useful. So you actually, there was a document written, uh, released by the FAO in 2007, which gave some recommendations on uh, what to put in. They may look like what I'm saying in this uh, lecture, because I wrote it, uh, so with Eva Plagani and about 30 other very high-end modelers in the fisheries world. And it, they really do work. This is why models in fisheries are probably having more of an input to real policy change than we see in other 
sectors or other industries where they're, they're not as far down that road of having evidence-based decision making. So when you're thinking about putting together an ecological model, but the same is true for human model, think about where most of the action happens and make that the focus of where you are. Think about whether you need to extend that to cover other parts of the animal's life history. So if I have an animal living on a coral reef, but it's born in the mangroves, you need to make the decision about whether you try to include, include the mangrove part of its life explicitly or whether you parameterize that and only focus on the coral part. But you need to make that an explicit decision to include or exclude that part of the life history. Equally, when an animal migrates out of the system, do you also cover where it goes, or do you have to just worry about where it is? So it might be that you choose to only worry about the system where you are locally, but then you need to think about parameterizing the other end. So an example is um, plovers and seabirds in Australia. They spend the other half of the year in Russia. Now, under our law, if they start to decline, we need to assume it's a local problem and respond immediately to that problem and close areas and all that kind of stuff, which has fairly large economic outcomes. And that was all written by a modeler about 35 years ago who just assumed that it would, the level of development in Siberia would never be to the level where it would be affecting the bird population. Now, that assumption is now wrong. They are affecting the bird population, as is climate change, and it's actually the Russian half of their life history that's collapsing. But it's the Australian law was assuming it was the Australian half and cutting off sectors. So that's where we had to rechange the assumptions and question if we needed to model the whole life history or whether we just had to play with the parameters that represented that other part of its life. There's also the way that you represent space. So the easiest way to do it is to have a grid. Humans think on grids. We can visualise cutting the world up into nice little squares and all that kind of thing. We don't think as easily in polygons, but this is actually how the world works. The world isn't universally homogeneous. We have eddies that concentrate things. We have roundabouts where all the most insane people drive, apparently. <laughs> you know, we don't, and we also don't have the information on this regular grid. So this is of the Azores, and while this is a model that runs, and it runs happily, the data it uses are only from a few spots. Whereas by drawing it this way, we've captured all the major features. We've got fine little boxes where lots of action happens and bigger boxes where you can get away with a more general representation statistically. And it also meant that we had multiple data points in every box. Now, I must admit that I started doing this kind of modelling, again, with the dinosaurs roaming the earth, because I had to try and fit a whole ecosystem model on a computer that my watch is now more powerful than. <laughs> but it's actually remained a very effective way, if you can get your head around it, of actually representing space. Though so more, and the physical climate world and the biogeochemical world have a halfway house where they have, they have a grid, but it's shaped based on the topography and stuff like that. So you can have hybrids as well. And that's important because of resolution problems. So this is an example of sea surface temperature um, in a global climate model with the level of error. So the more red it is, the, that was where there was a big error problem. Now, so they looked at an alternative grid that had nesting, more fine detail where they had the upwelling regions, or actually they could even embed finer scale models inside that bigger model grid and they got rid of the error because it was fine scale processes just in those locations. So they would have blown out computational time to put that fine scale everywhere and it wasn't needed. It was really only needed in these <coughs> areas where the finer details mattered. So that's why you need to think about what's appropriate at every scale. Similarly, in off Australia, we had a very coarse regular grid and it produced temperature predictions like this. Build in the finer grid, particularly picking out features of upwellings, and you get the much more detail that's important for how the biology of the system works. So being sensible about what resolution you need where is actually really important. Now, in terms of time, we need to think about it the same way. So the most common model steps evenly through time, whether it's a week or a month or a year. Everything is in lockstep together. But that's not actually how the world works either. So phytoplankton and bacteria can have multiple generations in a couple of days, while fish take much longer. So you can get around that by having one big step, for, let's say a daily step for fish, and then finest time steps 
for your, your plankton so that you've got it's also another cheap way that we did 20 or 30 years ago that when you're working on the scale of an uh, ecosystem is fine. It's called adaptive differencing. So you look in your numerical, your numerical solution scheme never to have your steps so big that you're creating numerical artefacts but you allow that step to be whatever it needs for the current condition of the system. So sometimes I can get away with really big steps but when there's a lot of dynamic activity happening I have to shrink my step accordingly so I don't create numerical mathematical errors so I don't mess up my approximation. It does mean I can get away with a lot simpler solution scheme that's computationally faster than a very more, much more complicated scheme. And for uncertain things like food webs, you can get away with a lot. There's actually another whole way of thinking about time though, and that's actually for each individual group only to put the time step into what it cares about. So if you think about um, Beth in the morning, you know, the, the whole six hours I'm asleep, I don't need minute time steps for what I'm doing. I'm in bed asleep. When I get up and I realise, oh shit, it is only 15 minutes till the bus gets here. There's a little bit more active participation, sprinting around the room, diving into the shower, leaving the room, remembering everything I've lost, go back to the room, come back down. You know, it's kind of you telescope that time. Or Lisa crossing the road when she realises the bus is coming. The telescoping of time becomes quite tight. But she doesn't need it for when she's just generally sitting here laughing at Beth. <laughs> so that's a different way. It's actually exactly how your computers run their operating systems. They don't put the same amount of time into everything you've got open. They're really only responding to when you're actually touching a program. So you can actually do ecosystems and, and other system models the same way. You do need an underlying heartbeat to make sure things don't get too temporally disconnected. We had a problem there for a while where fish that hadn't even been born yet were being eaten by a predator in the future. Um, <laughs> but there are some ways to fix those kind of problems. So then you get to the different kinds of models. So let's give you some examples. So we've got temperature, phytoplankton, nutrients. This way you've got the drivers of the system that we, we care about probably production and cycling. Uh, and what that does to the storage of carbon, for instance, in the deep ocean, and that you've got the direct influences on the major dynamics that's driving that. So you can think about what's, what are the things dictating how phytoplankton lives, where it is, how fast it produces, and then you can build those in. Equally, you can step up through um, from just the production level into the feed layers, the forage fish, and then into tuna. And as you get to the higher trophic levels, you often find the ones that humans care about the most, they start to even break down by their ages, whether they're larvae or adults, because they start to appreciate more and more that the detail matters. Now, for those who've worked in the zooplankton, we appreciate that there's detail there, and if you're worried about the zooplankton, you might need parts of the zooplankton life history. When you're trying to do a whole of system model, though, you have to figure out where to cut your losses. You can't have all the age classes of zooplankton if you've got to do the whole rest of the ecosystem as well. So you do have to think about it. But you have to also bring in the appropriate processes. So we didn't need to think about directed migration when we were just doing phytoplankton. But once you get into the tuna, you do have to think about over the course of a year or a life, where do they move and why do they move? So when you're putting together the ecological side, there's also some rules um, about how to do that. So how do you define a functional group? So we heard yesterday in the debate the discussion of functional groups. So does everyone know what a functional group is? Yes? Does anyone not know what a functional group is? So all the economists and the lawyers and everyone in the room knows what a functional group is. That's great. Because most, most ecologists I know don't know what it is. <laughs> so what a functional group is in mathematical terms is you as grouping species together that have the similar role in the system. So they live in a similar place, they use the system in a similar way, they eat a similar set of things. So most food web models only worry about what they eat, but actually when you get into a whole system model, it's how they use the system, including their size. So if you try to group things that have very fast life histories and things that have very slow life histories, even if they eat the same thing, you won't get the right answer because you've forgotten that delay part. It takes a long time for those slow growing things to do stuff. So you shouldn't group things that are more than about three times different in the speed that they live. You also shouldn't lump, yep? This is so similar to what uh, Ingrid was talking. 
about people, right? Cross screen groups and so on, isn't it? So biology and the human side, they really exactly. go on and on and on. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, it's something from Rashid and I didn't plan to interact like that. No. But it is actually something we took from anthropology is the best way of doing finding a functional group. So it was a method invented in ecology, the ecology then forgot about for 30 years, went over to anthropology, and it's come back. So it's called regular coloration. So if you draw, draw up your food web of what eats what, then you color things that share prey. So these two eat that. This eats that as well, but this one here isn't eaten by any of those. So it has to stay away by itself. So these ones eat that and are eaten by these. These ones eat this and are eaten by that. So you can start to clump up things with the similar connections. And it's, it came back from anthropology, who use it a lot to look at how people and networks are created in small communities. What was that called? Regular coloration. So this, the other thing it teaches you is not to lump predators and prey. That's actually where you get, it's hard when you've got something that's an omnivore, but if they're very specialist predator and prey, if you lump them, you again get the wrong kind of dynamics out of what you're doing. Which is a big issue because as someone who's reviewed quite a lot of ecosystem models, I'll get the transient killer whales, the, uh, the resident killer whales, 25 kinds of birds, 30 kinds of fish and then benthos. All of the invertebrates lumped together into some weird thing that looks like this. <laughs> Even though their dynamics are actually equally important. So if you have a, intentionally having a focus model and you've intentionally just had other benthic prey, that's fine. But if it's just because you couldn't find the data and you've got a bit lazy, that's not so fine. <laughs> so that's why you have to worry about how you put it together. But you also have to worry about being pragmatic about what you do put in, but just be aware that you're not going to cover it all. So, um, a friend of mine and a very good friend of uh, Rashid is a guy called Carl Walters, and he calls it vampires in the basement. So there's things that come out of nowhere when you least expect them, and just whop you up the back of the head. So, things that can go very wrong with the model is because something that you didn't think was important, that was a rare species, suddenly becomes important under a different set of conditions. And so you always have to be aware that you can't put everything in, so there might be something you've had to leave out that is actually important under a different set. You should also always allow for alternative stable states. So that's don't hardwire into your model the answers that you get out of it. So don't say, when the condition's like this, I have to have exactly this balance of animals at the other end. That has to come out as an emergent feature of the equations and the interactions. So those kind of shifts have to be emergent. Now, this, this is an example from Alaska, where they have their climate scenarios, they have a fairly fine detailed biogeochemical model of the kind Laurent was talking about, with size structured functional groups of the zooplankton and the phytoplankton. They do have a fairly simple representation of benthos, but that was intentional, because it's not a big part of their system. Uh, they did break it out for the species that directly interact with the species that they care about, which is cod in this particular case. And they have an individual based model, which I'll get to a bit later, of all of these fish. So what are those different ages doing in the different locations? And then they got to fisheries and economics, which when we first drew this picture 10 years ago was very simple, but I think it's much more elaborate now with different fleet types and different uh, motivations and gear types and different drivers. There is another way of doing things though, a very different way that I'll get onto a little bit uh, in my next lecture. But it's basically to say, even if there's classical ways of putting it together that are really obvious based on things that we can tangibly see, like a copepod or a cod, there are other ways of thinking about the world. And size-based modelling is now a very uh, common set of modelling that I'll talk about in the next lecture. But even in tackling size-based modelling, which have been basically about looking at the sizes of fish and who eats what, you can mix different kinds of models together. So they use a different way of representing the benthos to be able to allow to have both parts of the system. You also need to think about all of those same questions that we just went through for the resolution of the ecological world in the human world, because not all humans are identical. Yes, you can get some first pass answers just saying, okay, these fleets with these fishing mortality rates can affect the food webs in these ways. But the richness is actually in how people interact. 
how does that change through time? And with some fairly simple models, you can, like based on catch per unit effort, for instance, you can represent dynamical changes. So if there's less effort, they want to leave. If there's less catch per unit effort, they want to leave. If there's more, they want to join. Even those can get you a long way. But this is as much richness in the human world as in the animal world, and we're not special. As you heard with Rashid before, we just follow the same animal rules everybody else does. We just fancy up the language that we use to describe it. Okay, so if you've ever seen, well, I don't know if you've ever heard of the word bogan, but it's an Australian term for a loud young male, typically, well, who doesn't, hasn't had a lot of socio-economic education necessarily in the part of the world that I live in particular. And they think the best thing possible is to drive down small towns in their very souped up cars, blasting their horns. And there's not a lot of that difference in that to a peacock male showing off its tail. Okay, so the same kind of motivations are happening. You can draw some parallels. So that means that when you can take it from the physics side of the things through to the fish, you can also extend it into the fisheries. And this is a map of fleet use in a tuna fishery model of the, the Indian Ocean. And it's the same kind of idea. You can have the biological connect into the economics. So this is a model. This is a model of the, I've obviously forgot to keep my book, uh, that looked at the trade and the flow of small pelagic fish. So they had representation of the fish population, of how it was caught, then they represented the global trade of where those fish went and the demand in each sector so that they could look at the future of fish supply to different parts of the world and what were the implications for being able to access food. So you can actually get into those other more and more pictures. You can also represent scientists and how scientists work. How do we collect information? Where do we do it spatially? Which groups do we collect information on? so that you can understand yourself what are the implications for monitoring, how well can you actually represent that system of the monitoring data, but also what might be the gaps in your understanding of the system. Ironically, ecosystem models of the ocean are well, way more progressed than on the land because we couldn't get the data. So we have to think about with the data we had, what could be going on. Whereas in the land they go, oh, we don't have data on this, we'll just go out and collect it. So you couldn't do that in the ocean. So which it meant we're about 20 to 30 years ahead in the ocean and how to do this model. You can also represent the way the industry is reported. So how does it report its catch statistics? How much you know, misreporting is there? Do they tell the truth? Do they modify their behaviour? If an observer is on the boat, what are their costs involved? You know, both in getting the catch, in landing the catch, and sending it to market, what's the costs of having uh, the uh, management in place. So in Australia, the fishermen have to pay for their own management. So there's a very strong incentive there to make sure that the management is cost effective because they don't want to pay for extra stuff. So they pay a license fee every year to the government and the government then uses that money to pay for the management. And they do it across all of the different fisheries. So it means that the budget can be quite tight, but they're very, it means the fishermen are also very intellectually involved in thinking about what that management looks like. We can also test what it means to have the science in between. So how much evidence, how much information content is there in the methods being used? So we basically test how reliable the stock assessment methods are. So if you put the stock assessment method in there, is it reflecting back to you what your operation, what's called an operation, or what your food web is doing? So if you play out having your food web and the guy's fishing it and they collect data and they put it through the stock assessment, does that stock assessment trajectory look like anything like what was happening in your food web model so that you can understand where there might be sources of bias or error? So if a stock assessment model is biased, that's not bad so long as you know it's biased and it's consistently biased. So it's about understanding the tools that you've got so you make best use of them. This is an example of a hybrid model uh, from Ningaloo. So in this particular case, what we had was we've got the local going down to run the boat, the tourists go down to the beach or go for a swim, we've got fish swimming through the system. So this is a different kind of modeling again. It's called agent-based modeling. It's a bit like a computer game, a science-based computer game, basically. There's little rules about how the different agents interact, but you can have it, that it's an easy way where worrying about individuals is important. And in the places small as 
Ningaloo in terms of human population, it was important to be able to represent each individual and how they were using the system. This is the wire diagram of that entire Ningaloo system, right? So it looks a little bit overwhelming. We played in Australia, and it's called Where's Wally? It's Waldo in the US, I don't know what you call it in the rest of the world, but basically can you find the little figure inside the, the messy picture? So we had this up on the wall, blown up to about this size, and we asked the people that live in Exmouth, can you find yourself? And can you find what's important to you? And it basically boiled down to this is all the ocean bits, this is the food web bits, this was all the people, were they living in their housing, um, and how that competed with tourism, all well, this was the tourism bits. The purple bits was the management, this was their social perception, was what happening to them in their life here, making them happy or sad. This was the outside drivers, there was the economics, um, and then there was the, uh, the tourist accommodation, which was growing to take over this, so that the, the locals were being more and more pressured by what the tourists were doing. So it was about understanding where the processes were, but we made that diagram by going and talking. So Chris the other day laughed at the idea of talking to nearly everybody in Exmouth and how long it would take, but that's literally what we did. You know, we went to most of the population, not everybody, but pretty much to, you know, I went up there multiple times over a year and sat down with people and said, okay, help me understand, much like we just did on the paper before, what's, how did your system work? What's important to you? What are you connected to? And sometimes that was, I never get really dressed up, but at least semi-formally dressed up, sitting with managers both in Perth and Exmouth where they're very serious and it's in a boardroom and they're and then there was other times where I was literally running around on a beach barefoot with an indigenous elder drawing in the sand with a stick because you have to do the conversation in the way that they feel comfortable with. And he was much more comfortable getting me to experience the things that were important to him than to sit in a, an office. So you do need to make sure that even within one location that you touch the different ways that people communicate. So for that particular model, we crossed scales. We went from very fine scale representations put on regular grids for part of the system. So if we think about the physical world, it was represented with differential equations and statistical distributions. And then we had a metapopulation model for the benthic habitats. And then we had fish schools. And then for the largest predators, we actually played out the different parts of their life at an individual level. Equally on the human side, we had aggregate sector and input output models for the bigger regional uh, part of the human world. Then we had network models and demographic models for the individuals living in that world and how they used it. And then we had the impact models for how they used it and what effect that it had across to the other parts so that you could telescope as you need. And we also used different models for different parts of the life history. So for the larval stage, we used a partial differential equation model. And then we had schools of individuals and age-structured models for juvenile stages, and we were out to single adults. So you can actually telescope between the different models. So I work with, uh, well, he's retired now, he's a, he, did he finished his PhD roughly six months after he retired. So that's a very long PhD, as you <laughs> must imagine. But we encouraged him to do his PhD because he invented this mathematics. Basically, he showed that all of the classical mathematics we learn in high school, the calculus, the differential equations, are just special cases of what's called agent-based modelling. So we often hear about individual-based modelling or agent-based modelling that follow a set of a flow diagram of rules that I'll discuss in my next lecture, but it turns out that all mathematics sits within that kind of way of thinking about the world. So you could have a whole physics model, a whole climate model be one agent inside an agent-based model. So his PhD even made my ears bleed trying to follow all the maths and he had to invent new areas of maths to show it. But he, it was one of those things where at the end of the thesis he and I were sitting down and said, we didn't realise that you just proved that the universe could actually be an agent-based model, right Randall? He goes, yeah, that was a pretty cool outcome. <laughs> <laughs> so thinking about inside the model, you've got the location. So this particular place we wanted to model a part of Antarctica. We got up the bathymetry, so then yes, we were doing it by using the polygons, so matching the polygons to the features of the system. So you had some around these features, you had some depth layering. You could have used the regular grid, we chose not to. Then we had to think about time, so we needed at least seasonal because of the influence of the Antarctic 
Uh, there's also some calendar events, so you know things only reproduce once a year for the things that we were worried about, or once every couple of years. So we, instead of trying to do all of those events every time, sort of set up a, a calendar of events that will happen, get triggered as the model ticks along, and you might want to jump event to event rather than have a regular heartbeat. Then we looked at the, we got the bathymetry, we found the sediment and oceanography layers and fed those in. Uh, the habitat layers, which in this case was ice. Then we put in the food web. So this is a, it's a simplified food web of the system, but it has got the major components of production and the things that use it. Then you've got the fish groups that live in that system and how they interact with the benthos and the top predators. And then you've got the bigger transient things that move through the system as well. So the way to represent all of that was for ubiquitous things like microfauna, we just did have differential equations on a regular grid over the whole, or on that polygonal grid over the whole area. Then we had the age structure. Actually, this is the slide I didn't think I was using, but it's all right. So for each of these orange dots, they represent a different species with its own habitat preference, its own diet, and its own internal age structure. And then for these other things, where individuals were important, then we started to play out um, them as individuals or small groups of individuals. Now the reason to do that is, I use my kids as examples a lot, but my daughter really loves Ice Age. Okay, so that movie about the, the mammoth and the sloth, and the sloth in particular, which he thinks is like a brother's. Um, she loves it, and in one of the movies, they, they interact with dodos. Okay, so the last female dodo falls over the cliff. It's kind of important that that was the last female, even if there's a lot of males left. And it's those kind of situations where the identity of what who of the animal or the person that's doing the action, so if it's the last female, then it matters. So where you've got small group dynamics as important, that's when you start to play it out at these finer scales. Then we also brought in the main human activities, both the, the parks, the fisheries and the illegal fishing in the past, but also tourism, which is now major pressure in the area, all the people flooding to see Antarctica before it's not the same way anymore. Uh, ironically, making it not the same way anymore. Uh, and then the on-ice science activities, which was also modifying the system. There was a bigger scale to think about as well, which was the economic drivers down there, but also the politics and how that was influencing the way the area was managed. So we had to actually model the Kamala negotiation process, because that was having a strong influence on the rules that were being put in place down there. Which is captured by that, the science and the monitoring feeding into that process. So now that you've heard about all the different ways that and things that are important to think about in putting together a model, like the resolution and the detail, you get another two minutes to see if you want to tweak or polish up your model. Because this is the version that will go up on the wall. So hopefully you're all happy with your models now. We've got about three more slides to the end of this one and then we'll start talking about model types. So when you're looking at, once you've got your model and it's running, there's multiple different kinds of errors that are possible. So different shapes of errors, whether they're uniform or log normal, whether there's patchiness. What the idea of error though is that you've got an actual value and then you've got what your sample thinks it is. And the hope is that that sampling distribution actually contains actual value. The same thing is true in models. So you've got a truth. Even observ observationalists don't always pop up to this, but there is always an error in getting that observation. They don't actually give you back the true answer necessarily. It'll be in the, the envelope of uncertainty, but there is a little bit of error there. Then you've got your prediction, and the prediction's uncertainty, and then this is the difference. So this is your predictive error. It's the difference between what you're predicting and the actual truth. And the residual error is actually the difference between the prediction and the observation. So that's important to think about. We can only ever compare against the observation, but sometimes you get into a situation where you're doing as well, if not better, than observations with your model. So one thing to keep in mind is you should, when your model is not doing what the observations say, check your model first to make sure you haven't made any mistakes. But if you literally can't find anything, then go check the observations. I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting there banging my head on the wall. Why is this not working? 
and they go look at the experimental data and there was a mistake. Or, you know, it's, yeah, there's a whole bunch of times when the data is not actually trustworthy. So don't always assume that the model is the ultimate problem. Uh, you can actually be closer with the model than actually the observationalist can get. So, but you should always still be the biggest critic of your own model. You know all the shortcuts you took to get it to work. So you should always be the one that's the most critical about it. So to sum up everything we've said so far, there's lots of, you need to define your system, you need to identify the links in the system, whether they're one way or two way. You need to think about what, how much you want to resolve which bits you're intentionally leaving out, what you need to worry about, and whether you can actually mimic the real world. So what you want to do is a bit like a Turing test for models. Is the model creating a dynamic that's believable like the real world, or is it such a cartoon that it's giving you insights, but it's not ma maybe delivering on what you need? So that's kind of the ultimate test. Is it actually providing the kind of information that's useful? Okay. So the best practice is, for me, for the kind of modelling that I do, is that I'm using it as a what-if world. So I play out those different parts of the, the, the model, the modelling of the adaptive management, and say, if the world works like this, what are the implications? I'm not trying to give a weather forecast or a human health index kind of thing. I'm actually just trying to say, if the world works like this, what are the outcomes? So I can think and play, play. We actually learn the most as adults, particularly in the developed Western world, they get very serious and you know, every time I say bring in Lego, for instance, to help people think, initially there's a lot of resistance. And then you can get their it spark their inner child. People learn most when they're playing. So you don't see a small child go running against the wall or hitting a bat and going, well that's just making me look embarrassing, I think I'll sit in the corner. They're more likely to laugh with each other. And that's that coordination, that exploration. You need to trigger that if you're really going to use models to their most. You do need to identify some anchor points. So I want the world to be looking at this kind of question, but allow that to be some drift so they can get the flexibility and the dynamic change that's actually an important part of this. But basically the biggest message is there's no one right model, there's no one right way of doing the world. Try lots of different options. The more the merrier, that diversity is really important when you're doing modeling. So what you want a world, you don't want to try and have everything in one world, you want to have lots of different ways of thinking about the world. Because the, the truth is the intersection of independent lies. So the guy at the start, Richard Levins, that's what he said. And Pablo Picasso effectively said the same thing. By looking at the world through our simplified models, which are lies, they're not the exact world, by getting all of those to align, we can get insights we wouldn't get any other way. Okay.